I've always been so impressed with how J.R.R. Tolkien led his atheist friend C.S. Lewis toward faith in Christianity. You know, J.R.R. Tolkien and Lewis were both uh, teachers at Oxford. Uh, Lewis was a lecturer, Tolkien was a full professor, a little older. Tolkien was a, uh, a very devout Catholic Christian believer. Uh, Lewis was an atheist, and one day, walking on Addison's Walk, around, along the River Cherwell, by uh, Lewis's rooms, Tolkien made an evangelistic move that basically laid the foundation for that atheist becoming a believer. And I've always been amazed. You want to know what it is? You, to understand it, you got to go to Tolkien's not that easy to read, but absolutely crucial to read essay called On Fairy Stories. One of the things that he says on fairy stories that I think is amazing to me is what he calls secondary belief. He says when, um, when somebody tells you a story and you know it really happened, that's primary belief. But when someone tells you a story that you know is fictional, you know it's fiction, but it's so well told and the characters are so well developed and the plot is so well developed too, that even though you might sit there at the movie or listen to read the book and you really kind of indifferent yet you get you get drawn in right you get scared you get happy because uh, if the story is well told Tolkien said then the story commands what he calls secondary belief it draws you in it makes you have the feelings as if to some degree it was true you get just as scared even though you know it's not true but you're scared for that character and you care about that character and you're excited when you see the resolution he calls that secondary belief first thing that's very important then he goes along and says there's a kind of story that human beings even today even today we live in a secular realm a secular time a scientific time and and the, and the, the leading lights of modern literature uh, have been telling us you know life is meaningless then you die uh, and yet Tolkien says we still crave a certain kind of story we crave it in movies, we crave it in, uh, you know, in books. And these are stories that depict a supernatural world. We're just fascinated by that, those stories. That depict being able to cheat death, escape death, escape aging in time. Stories that show us a love that is eternal. A love without parting, a love that, that overcomes death. We want stories about good absolutely triumphing over evil, destroying evil. We love, we love stories about victory snatched from the jaws of defeat or sacrificial heroism that brings life out of certain death. And we pay money to watch those movies and we pay money to read about those stories. And you know, a modern, the, the modern literati hate they're, they're myths, they're legends, they're fairy stories, they're fairy tales, basically. And modern people say, life is not like that. But Tolkien points out the fact that these are deep human longings. And for some reason, human beings, even in our day and time, want the kind of stories that are very, very well told, that evoke secondary belief, that catch you up in them, that tell you that good will triumph over evil, that there is a supernatural world, that you're not stuck in time, that there is love without parting, that there is a way of escaping death. Now, Tolkien said, why would people still feel this way? Now, what Tolkien's about to say here, I can't prove from the Bible, but it fits in with the Bible. He says, we're made in the image of God, but we're fallen. And therefore, weirdly enough, human, being know, human beings know at the de fact level, we all do have to die. That evil often triumphs that no matter how much you love somebody, eventually you're gonna lose that person, or they're gonna lose you. And we know at the factual level, and, and we also are told at the factual level, there's no supernatural. So at the factual level, there's no supernatural, we're gonna die, there's no escape, uh, good is not gonna triumph at the factual level, and yet underneath, almost, he says, for all human beings feel, but there shouldn't be death. We're not meant to die. We're not meant to lose our loved ones. Good should be triumphing over evil. 
See, there ought to be a supernatural world. Should, we shouldn't be just stuck in time and then we're dead. That at a deeper level, we feel like this is how reality ought to be. In fact, this is, that's the reason why Tolkien believed that even though fairy stories at the factual level aren't true, most people feel in some ways they are true. They point to an underlying reality that's almost more true than the way life is actually being lived in this world. And that's the reason why we still pay good money to see the kind of, the, that's the reason why the happy endings, that's the reason why the heroic sacrifices that bring good out of, uh, you know, to triumph out of, out of defeat and all that, well, that's, well, that's, what we, that's what we still want to watch. We don't want to read Ulysses. See? We don't want to, we don't want to read high literature that's nice and nihilistic because that's the way life really is. We say, well, maybe it is, but it shouldn't be. And that's the reason why the popular stories tend to be like fairy tales. And so Lewis, C.S. Lewis, though he was an atheist, really, really, really felt the power of the myths and the legends and the fairy tales, and he loved them. But, he said, even though they point to a kind of what life ought to be like, they're really not. It's that, you know, they're not true. And, and as he was walking along with Tolkien that day, he said something like this. He said, yes, but myths, fairy tales, are lies, though breathed through silver. Myths are lies, even though they're breathed through silver. As beautiful as they are, as much as they point to the way I think the life really ought to be, they're just the lies. And Tolkien said, no, they're not. And he says, here's why I'd say they're not. Look at the gospel. Look at the story of Jesus. Do you realize what you have there? Everything that moves you about a story. Escape from death. A love that conquers death. Good triumphing over evil. Heroic self-sacrifice. And, and when everything looks the darkest, life out of death. Triumph out of victory, uh, out of defeat. Everything you want in a story. Lewis said, yes, it's true. But he says, I want you to see something. The gospel story of Jesus is not one more wonderful story pointing to the underlying reality. Rather, Jesus is the underlying reality to which all the stories point. And the reason we know that is because of the resurrection. See, Tolkien says the resurrection is what happened. The resurrection was, was this underlying reality breaking into this world. And the way life ought to be and the way life is, Jesus Christ is our great captain. He's opened a cleft in the pitiless walls of the world. He's opened, he's punched a hole through that concrete slab between life as it is and life as it ought to be, between the ideal and the real. And now, because of the resurrection, the resurrection proves that the cross was not a defeat, it was a triumph. It proves that, it's, that Jesus made satisfaction for sins. It proves that now God can come into your life. It proves that now Jesus can come into your life because he's alive. He says, take a look at the evidence for the resurrection. He basically said that. The resurrection means that Jesus is not one more beautiful story that makes you feel good for a while, and then the lights dim and you walk out into the real world. Jesus Christ is the underlying reality to which all the stories point, breaking into our world. And that's the reason why there's a place where uh, in the fairy tale, in this, on fairy stories, Tolkien says this. He says, the peculiar quality of the joy in a successful fairy tale can be explained as a sudden glimpse of an underlying reality. But the Gospels contain a story of a larger kind which embraces all the essence of those wonderful fairy stories. The Gospels contain the greatest and most complete conceivable eucatastrophe, which is the good catastrophe. The catastrophe is the old Greek word for a world-changing turn. He says, the story of the gospel has entered history and the primary world. The birth of Christ is the eucatastrophe of man's history. The resurrection is the eucatastrophe of the story of the incarnation. The whole story ends in joy. There is no tale ever told that men would rather find was true than Jesus' life, and none which so many skeptical men have accepted as true on its own merits. Emil Callier was a professor of philosophy at Princeton Seminary, and he tells a story of how he actually found faith. He was an agnostic, uh, in, uh, went off to World War I. Uh, he was an agnostic, he didn't really believe in God, 
He was into philosophy. He was kind of skeptical about the whole idea of religion. But during World War I, he, like, he had an experience like a lot of other World War I people. He actually, had, one of his best friends was talking to him right next to him about his mother. Died like that with a bullet in his chest. Later on, a bullet hit him. He was in the hospital for a while. And he realized, even though he was an agnostic and he still wasn't sure if he believed in God, he realized that uh, to really make sense of this world and this life, he was going to need more help than just his skeptical philosophy. So he started reading poetry, and he started reading books, he started reading things, and every so often he would find a passage in this book or this writer or this author that really seemed to make sense to him. And he said, in his, uh, in his this account, he said, I began, to say, I began to long for a book that understood me. I began to long for a book that understood me. And he came up with an idea. He bought a, a leather-bound little diary, blank place, and he said every single time he read something that seemed to make sense to him and help him, he was going to copy it down. And after about a year, he hoped that he would someday sit down and open it up and read page after page, and I'd finally have a book that made sense of my life and made sense of the world and gave me the joy I was looking for. And after he worked on it for a year or two, one day he went out and sat under a tree and got his book out, and as he read it for the first time, you know, just to read it through for the first time, he was deeply disappointed. He realized he'd already changed. And so some of the things that really hit him a year ago didn't hit him anymore. And he realized that this was, he, he, he himself was a moving target. That any book he compiled or any book he wrote would be sort of like a gun pointed here, and then he would move. And he said, I realized I would never, he said, I was never gonna find a book that understood me. That very day, as he was sitting under the tree, his wife was out walking their little infant child. And along the way, had, had talked to a French Huguenot uh, pastor who had given her a, a Bible in French. And they didn't have a Bible in the house, and she thought it would be a good idea. He brought it back, and he saw it, and he said, give that to me. And he began reading the Gospels. He said, I read all night, almost all night. And I actually realized, as I was looking at the one the Gospel was written about, that here, finally, I have a book that's alive and a book that understands me. But it's not just a book that understands me. He went into the word of the Lord to find the Lord of the word, Jesus Christ, the true story of Jesus. That's what the world needs, that's what you need.